Good afternoon. We are so excited that so many of you have joined us for our second event of Critical Conversations. My name is Eula Taylor, and I'll, as you know, I'm the proud chair of the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Our Critical Conversations series is organized around two themes, celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Barbara T. Christian, an architect of Black feminist criticism, a founding member of our department, and a gifted writer and teacher, as well as exploring the concept of abolition democracy, thinking creatively and collaboratively about the practice of abolition as necessary to building life-affirming institutions and robust democratic structures. Through both themes we ask, what are the lessons of the Black feminist, Black radical, and Black intellectual traditions for our moment? And what is the role of Black studies in building more just futures? Before we begin today's conversation, Reaping What We Sow, a conversation with Miss Alice Walker, I want to give my colleagues Professors Lee Rayford, Nikki Jones, and Tiana Pichelle, an opportunity to share a bit more about our activities and to recognize the financial support for all of our efforts. Thank you, Eula, and good afternoon, everyone. It truly is an honor for our department to host this conversation today and for the Abolition Democracy Initiative to play a role in co-organizing co this event. The Abolition Democracy Initiative, also uh, referred to as the ADI in our department, is a department initiative that works in a synergistic way with the Black Studies Collaboratory to center and respond to the most pressing questions of the moment. Questions that are perhaps new to some, but that we understand as enduring questions about Black freedom and the ongoing project of abolition. With support from the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, the Chancellor's Office, and Dean Rock Array, the ADI builds on the work of W.B. Du Bois and Angela Davis and others in an effort to support and amplify the work of academics and activists who are actively imagining and building, as we speak, a world in which policing and prisons are obsolete. ADI supports collaborative, community-oriented, anti-racist research in the social sciences that centers Black humanity and critical epistemologies like the Black radical and Black feminist traditions. The ADI also supports public engagement activities and conversations like this one today, conversations that will invite, inspire, and influence members of our department, the campus community, and our community beyond the boundaries of campus. The Critical Conversation Series stands as an open invitation to all of you out there to join these conversations through the Gateway of Black Studies. We hope that these conversations will inspire you to commit or recommit to the important and unfinished work of building up the life-affirming institutions and relationships we need now, we also want the work of the ADI to have some impact, impact beyond the academy to influence decision-making, policy, and practice. We look forward to the conversation ahead. With that, I will turn it over to my brilliant colleague and program director for the Black Studies Collaboratory, Professor Lee Rayford. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Eula. Thank you, Nikki. I'm so thrilled that we are here today, um, and I'm so glad all of you could join us. Um, again, my name is Lee Rayford, and I'm proud to be the inaugural director of the Black Studies Collaboratory. Um, we are a recipient of a Mellon Foundation Just Futures grant, which is a collaborative initiative to address racial inequality through bold and unique humanities-based research projects. The Black Studies Collaboratory asks, what is the role of Black Studies in building a more just future? And how do we solidify our commitment to Black Studies as a public good? Among our goals for the Black Studies Collaboratory is to provide space for critical engagement and collaborative dreaming to create opportunities for joyful and generative engagement among Black faculty, students, staff, the surrounding community, and around the country. And certainly today's event um, is in that spirit. Our work over the next three years in the Black Studies Collaboratory um, will consist of academic year think tanks, summer labs for graduate students, research grants for faculty and students, and a university course open to the public. The Black Futures Retreat, which will, uh, or, will be organized in collaboration with a host of community partners, will be the culmination of our initiative. Um, before I turn to my colleague, 
co-conspirator and co-lead on this grant, mm -hmm. Dr. Tiana um, Pichel, I want to acknowledge and thank all of our collaborators and supporters. Um, first, I want to thank Ms. Joan Mura, Ms. Alice Walker's assistant, for helping us organize today. I want to thank our long-term, long-time departmental supporters, Michael and Jeannie Williams. Um, I want to thank Stanford University's excuse me, Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, led by Dr. Jennifer Brody, um, who graciously offered um, co-sponsorship of this event. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank wholeheartedly um, our African American Studies Department administrative staff, Sandra Richmond, Lauren Taylor, and Maria Aradia. Um, I want to thank our graduate student assistants, Rachel Anspach, Gilberta Rosa Duran, and Delphine Sims for all of their incredible hard work. The Assistant Dean of Development of Social Sciences, Christian Gordon and his staff, especially Hagit Caspi and Debbie Kelly, have been instrumental in um, bringing these, these events to you. And we'd like to also thank Educational Technology Services for their um, expert running of this event, um, especially Gwen Pointeau. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it to my um, wonderful colleague, Tiana Pichel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so the largest component of the Black Studies Collaboratory is our Abolition Democracy Fellows Program, which will welcome our first um, cohort later this fall and hopefully in person um, in bringing elders, activists, artists, postdoctoral and dissertation fellows into critical engagement and collaborative imagining. The Fellows Program aims to create a shared space for experimentation, world building and exchange towards more just futures. So it is with great pleasure and excitement that we announce our first fellow, Ms. Daphne Muse, who will serve as our inaugural elder in residence. A writer, activist archivist, cultural broker, and a longtime member of Alice Walker's Brain Trust, Daphne Muse <laughs> has already contributed so much to our community in the Department of African American Studies at Berkeley and to the greater Bay Area Black community. Her life's work is truly remarkable and her enthusiasm and I should say laughter is contagious. We are so honored she has accepted our invitation and we look forward to welcoming her along with other fellows in the fall. We will now hear from Dr. Eula Taylor who will introduce the moderators for today's conversation with Alice Walker. Thank you. Thank you, professors Lee Rayford, Nikki Jones and Tiana Pichel. Now I have the pleasure to introduce our two moderators who will in turn introduce Ms. Alice Walker and begin the conversation. Professor Derek Scott is a professor in African American studies here at UC Berkeley and is the author of Extravagant Objection, Blackness, Power and Sexuality in the African American Literary Imagination winner of the 2011 Alan Bray Prize for Queer Studies of the Modern Language Association, and the author of the novels Hex, published in 2007, and Traitors to the Race in 1995. And we are so excited about his forthcoming novel, Keeping It Unreal, Black Queer Fantasy and Superhero Comics. Keeping It Unreal examines representations of Blackness in the fantasy-infused genres of comics, film, and fantasy, and theorizes how fantasies of Black power fashion theoretical and political aesthetics to challenge white supremacy and anti-Blackness. Yeah. There also teaches for the department his popular course on the novels of Toni Morrison. Derek's co-moderator is Ra Malaika Mhotep, who is a Black feminist writer and performance artist from Atlanta, Georgia, currently pursuing a doctoral degree in African Diaspora Studies in the Department of African American Studies here at UC Berkeley. Her intellectual and creative work tends to the relationships between queer articul articulations of Black femininity, vernacular culture, and the performance of labor. She is the co-convener of an embodied spiritual political education project called the Church of Black Feminist Thought. I will now turn it over 
to both Derek and Malika. Thank you, Eula. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, wonderful to have you all here this afternoon for this conversation we're going to have with Alice Walker. Um, Alice Walker needs no introduction, but as an offering of our love and appreciation for the breadth of her life's work, Malika and I are going to offer one anyway. Uh, during the first panel of this critical conversation series, poet and theorist Fred Moten lauded Barbara Christian's practice of being in an active relationship with the Black women writers of her time. She sought them out, she reviewed their books, and she built courses that would introduce them to her students. Alice Walker is a writer to whom Barbara Christian paid rigorous and loving attention, and also a peer and co-steward of the Black feminist and womanist traditions. It also bears mentioning that Alice Walker was the friend of another of our department anchor ancestors, the poet activist June Jordan. It's our hope that this conversation today will honor the spirit of this intimate network of Black feminist and womanist fellowship. Alice Walker is an internationally celebrated writer, poet, and activist whose books include seven novels, four collections of short stories, four children's books, and volumes of essays and poetry, including the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction and National Book Award winning work, The Color Purple. Walker has been an activist all of her adult life and believes that learning to extend the range of our compassion is activity and work available to all. She's a staunch defender, not only of human rights, but of the rights of all living beings. She's one of the world's most prolific writers, yet continues to travel the world to stand on the side of the poor and the economically, spiritually, and politically oppressed. She also stands on the side of the revolutionaries, teachers, and leaders who seek change and transformation of the world. In the essay titled, Alice Walker, the Black Woman Artist is Wayward, Barbara Christian described the defining characteristics of Walker's writing in terms that articulate exactly why Walker's work and her wisdom are indispensable to the future of Black studies. Walker's peculiar sound, Christian writes, the specific mode through which her deepening of self-knowledge and self-love comes seems to have much to do with her contrariness her willingness at all turns to challenge the fashionable belief of the day, to re-examine it in the light of her own experiences and of dearly worn principles that she has previously challenged and absorbed. There is a sense in which the forbidden in society is consistently approached by Walker as a possible route to truth. At the core of this contrariness is an unwavering honesty about what she sees. And so, with very full hearts, mm -hmm. we welcome you, Miss Alice Walker, and your unwavering honesty as we reflect on the legacy of Barbara Christian and the themes of creativity, freedom, and survival your work has illuminated for us all. Um, and to start, we just want to ask how you're doing and what's something bringing you joy today? Oh, I'm doing well. Uh, it's been a little chilly in the night here in Jalisco because of the storms and the cold weather, but otherwise it's, it's extremely beautiful. Uh, and I'm well taken care of and my friends are fairly near and my dog is very near. Mm -hmm. um, so life is good. Thank you, we're so happy. I am literally bursting. I'm sure you can tell, but I just had to name it before I keep talking. Um, our first question was to invite just some reflection on the spirit of friendship, of your, your creative and social relationships with Barbara Christian and June Jordan. Would you reflect on those friendships for us and what they've meant to your work? Uh, well, June and I were actually warriors connected, you know, almost at all times, even though we were very different. And this is something that we should really think about a lot, how you can have goals in terms of changing society, but you don't have to really agree with each other all the time. It just isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and with Barbara, I would say we were more colleagues than we were friends. Uh, we weren't, uh, you know, June and I talked about intimate things too, but Barbara and I did not. We talked more about, you know, work and, um, I remember my strongest memory of her, I think, is that after I had convened a gathering of women, and I think maybe one man, maybe Robert Allen, mm -hmm. um, 
to talk about whether we should proceed with making a film of the color purple. Uh, she, she, you know, thought it was a good idea, you know, since it, you, you understand that once Hollywood gets a hold of something, they're quite capable of going along with it, whether you want to go or not. I mean, they just change the colors of the people, right? So we knew that. Um, and so she was the kind of person who was very uh, clear about what she thought, what the risks would be, you know, what it would entail, which is wonderful to have in a friend, to have someone who just you know, outlines all the possibilities. And then when the film was made, she didn't like it. And, and so that was also very good because she could disagree and, you know, just say, well, I think, you know, they missed the whole point. Uh, and that is very valuable because you don't want, you know, friends and colleagues uh, who will lie to you. It, it's not helpful. It just isn't. Um, so we were on the same side and we knew that. Yes. Well, sort of sticking with uh, talking about Barbara Christian, Ms. Walker, um, for many of us in the Academy who identify ourselves as following in the legacy of Barbara Christian, a lot of us reference her essay from 1987 called The Race for Theory, where she argues that theorizing in the African-American intellectual tradition has often or even primarily been done in fiction by fiction writers. And she mentions you a couple of times in that essay. And we want to ask, do you think of yourself as doing the work of theory, of theorizing or creating theory in what you write? And if you do, what are you theorizing currently in your poetry and fiction? I don't. I don't think about that at all. I think about what brings me joy and what intrigues me and what seems wonderful and what seems maddening. Uh, it's for somebody else to do the theorizing, and I'm happy for them to do it. I think I would feel weighed down by even thinking about thinking about what I'm doing. The joy of doing for me is very much the same joy I imagine a flower feels as it's blooming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and really right in alignment with our next question, um, which is about how your writing um, pulls on our senses always engaging sensorially, sensorial experiences so rigorously um, and wanting to hear you talk a little bit about why that's important to you and perhaps why you feel that's important to Black thought and Black life and Black literature. We mustn't become a people who can't feel. We see what happens to people who, who just stop feeling. Uh, and I just put on my blog something about, well, it was, <clears throat> it's kind of a review <clears throat> of this last incredible book about Malcolm X. <clears throat> where, you know, it's just mind boggling and blowing this, this book. Um, but what, what I was wanting to share was that he had the, the nerve and the courage uh, to keep reaching for his own spirit. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and when you don't do that, you become like so many of the people in the culture that we're surrounded by. They're just bodies. They, they have no... I mean, from, you know, my observation, the soul is gone. You know, they're, they're basically meat people. Uh, and, and that is to say, you know, that they have this, you know, the body, uh, but they don't really have a light. They're, they're not really, and, and that, you know, that that is something worth um, talking about and understanding in our culture, because otherwise we will just, um, imitate what we see, which would destroy so much that is so beautiful in our spirits. I mean, we were not meant to be meat people. I mean, some of us, unfortunately, are, um, but that, that was never intended for us. We, we don't come from, you know, a tradition where you just stomp all over your, your heart and your spirit. You affirm your heart and your spirit even when you have to adopt a God that is foreign to you. You know, you yes. use that God to help you stay alive in your spirit. I mean, that's what God has been for people who could not possibly believe as they were branded, you know, that Jesus yes. wanted that mark on their body, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And are you thinking about, um, 
like when you develop characters, are you thinking about ways to like make that everything you just shared, just like felt in the characters that you create? Who knows how characters are formed? <laughs> who knows where they come from? You know, who, who knows what creation is? Yeah. I'm creating just like anything else here on the planet. You know, that is what I do. That is my job. That is my function. <clears throat> that is my being. And so I don't have all the questions about which, you know, why and this and that. I mean, sometimes I, I want to um, form something so that other people can see what mm -hmm. I'm doing. I mean, it's like making a, any other object. You know, if you, if you want to give people water, you have to create a, a cup, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I can see that I'm doing that. And that is to say that there are certain realities that I feel I'm uniquely placed to understand and have been educated and, and, and worked with by, you know, forces of whatever kind to deliver that. And, and I see that as, um, you know, basically is, is my reason for being, you know, and, and I love it. I love that because I see that everything else in nature produces what it produces. You know, why, why shouldn't we? Mm. So, so in a way, the theorizing part is just really foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that in academia, you know, it's sometimes thought of as just totally necessary and we have to, you know. I, I really am not, um, I've never been all that attractive. I like instead to feel mm -hmm. and to grow from my feeling you know, to even grow my understanding from my feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Ms. Walker, uh, in this period of COVID, a lot of us have been experiencing forced isolation and solitude as a privation. Um, but you've written about how solitude is really fundamental to your practice and to your spiritual practice as well as your work. So could you talk about the lessons of solitude or how this period has been for you in terms of this, uh, the forced isolation all of us are experiencing? I've enjoyed it. Uh, I've enjoyed having, you know, my usual solitude basically, uh, which is to say that of course I get a little stir crazy from time to time, but then I've always gotten a little stir crazy. And that's when I traditionally have planned big parties. <laughs> Uh, and wonderful picnics and, and, you know, people spread all over the land and sleeping overnight in the hay. I mean, that's, that's how it goes, you know. Uh, but for so much of the time, I'm perfectly content in solitude and it, it feeds me. Um, and my thought uh, is clarified, you know, in, in that silence, just the same way that when you make tea or something and the the leaves drop to the bottom and you, you get your, your pure tea. It's like that, you know? And so I've, I've learned to really treasure that a lot. Could you talk a little bit about your, your daily rituals? I'm sorry? Could you talk a little bit about your daily rituals in terms of solitude and, and, and one, of the, one of the questions that came up from one of the registrants was, how is it that you're able to um, do your work and also maintain peace that you're, how do you balance those things? I maintain peace because I'm doing my work. <laughs> if I were not doing my work, I would not be at peace. And I don't see how people can be mm. if they don't do their work. I honestly don't get it. How can you, um, given, you know, given yourself your, and your education and your tools, you know, your training, your, experience, how can you not use that uh, to do the work that clearly is yours to do? And, and my hope for everyone is that there is or becomes a clear work that they know is theirs. Nobody else can do it. So there's a great deal of peace in that. You know, just, just to know that you're here, you have this to do. Um, no matter you know who is against it and who who hates it and who doesn't want it, you know that's their problem. I mean, your job is to do what you're here to do, and and I, I've been very joyful 
you know, I've had some, you know, sinks, of course, like all of us, but overwhelmingly, I have felt just incredible joy at making that contribution to life, you know, that I have been gifted, really, to, to, to provide. And I don't even understand quite how it happened. You know, I'm one of eight children. We were very poor in the South, da, 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 all of that. And yet somehow uh, my desire to share, I think the, the fundamental joy I found in reading, learning to read so early and, and, and recognizing the magic of it, I just wanted that for everyone. And so that's been part of my path, to make sure that that is, is passed on. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled that we're having the chance to just explore all these regions um, of thought and feeling. Um, my question, or this question, um, and our questions are kind of combining things that we came up with and feedback we got from registrants. Um, but I'm thinking about ways that you find yourself in conversation with the the past or specifically the kind of like southern traditions of, of storytelling of wisdom sharing that come before you um and and how you feel like in knowing that or however you feel about your relationship to the past and ancient wisdoms and all those things um what's your relationship to the future like do you find yourself writing for the future or towards the future um or are you writing for the present or both or everything um is there a future? <laughs> Good question. You know, I mean, we, we kind of know we've had a past, but I'm not so sure we know we have a future. Uh, but what there is, you know, uh, what can you say except that you will continue to do your best uh, and, you know, try to arouse the humans to do their best and to you know, get them really to see that they're in incredible danger uh, and to act. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it sounds like kind of a downer, but uh, it's very realistic. And I, I would like more realism around this issue of future. You know, I mean, more people than you would like to think about just take it for granted. Well, why, why would you do that? Yes. You know, I mean, not, not, I mean, there, there will be a future, of course, for planets and stars and, you know, Earth, maybe. But, you know, maybe not for, for you. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I would really, really like us to really hone in on that. Because, you know, I love little ones as much as anybody. But it's harder and harder to see them come into the world. Mm -hmm. that humans have ruined. Have you felt that sense of danger as a consistent presence throughout your writing career? No, not that there was no future. I mean, hardly any. Uh, because lucky for me, I, when I grew up, you know, we, we got our water from a spring. It just came up out of the ground. It was perfectly pure and delicious. Now there are millions of people on the planet who have no idea what that even, they can't even imagine it. I mean, their water is so foul or, you know, hardly, they, ha they hardly have any water. Um, so these are issues that I think, you know, the academy might work into all of this theorizing. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? That we, we're really down to it now. We, we're really, you know, I mean, we're really, we're, we're there, we're there. And that is something that I think we really have to, you know, see. And, and then, and then from that, from that place, what do we do as a, as a human race? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you work in a range of forms in poetry, fiction, commentary, gardening, photography, what you write on your website. What moves you to do work in all of those different forms? What kinds of 
impetuses or questions um, move you towards doing different forms of expression? Absolute love. Totally. Um, I garden because I love to plant. I come from generations of farmers, you know, who, who also could tell when spring was coming by the scent of the wind. I don't want to lose that. Um, you know, I, I dance because in my community, that's what you love to do on a Saturday night. You dance, you found some kind of community and you did that. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm just basically living out uh, the, 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 the life of the ancestors. I mean, it's all coming through me. Uh, and, and I'm living in that stream. But fine tune your question because I think I'm kind of jumping around it. Well, uh, I guess part of the question is, are there particular forms that address needs or um, desires for expression that come up for you and, and why a particular form at a particular time? So for example, now in the current moment in what the exigencies of the moment are as you've been talking about where it's as though our future is fleeting before us and we don't have one what kinds of forms of expression seem most important to you uh, or most expressive for you in dealing with that study mm -hmm. believe it or not i think that part of why we're lost is that we've forgotten we have to study where we've come from and what we're doing Mm -hmm. And I, I just can't stress enough how much I want our people, all people, but you know, our people, to really get a grip on how you have to understand where you've been in order to know where you are or where you're going. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, in much of our you know, community, people don't honor study. They don't. And I mean, I, I see that in my own family, although I have a niece who just left two days ago, <clears throat> you know, who the whole time she was here, she was reading this new incredible biography of Malcolm X <clears throat> because I had been raving about it. I had been raving about this, this new book about Malcolm, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, poco a poco, little by little, or, or maybe not so little, we have to really help our young understand that in order to know where they're going or where they are, they have to study. They have to study. They can't just <clears throat> think they're learning by listening to hip hop. I mean, they are learning something, you know, and, and God bless them and bless hip, hip hop. But, you know, it, it's very deep, the stuff we need to know. And you have to find wisdom and use it uh, in order to understand where you are. It's, it's really very simple. You know, um, when I was in high school, I was the only person in my whole school who just loved reading, you know, and, and who could just be found somewhere, you know, trying to understand, you know, the 16th century, because I could, I could almost then see, I, I could begin to see how it hadn't died the 16th century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those old centuries don't die necessarily. You know, you, you look up and damn, they're still there in some form. Or look at our constitution. I mean, look at our political right. thing here. You know, I mean, um, if it were not set up in such a way that, you know, Trump was acquitted, uh, you know, we'd be in a whole different situation. But but no, we're, we're not really examining, you know, the, the history enough to see how it continues to make rules that we follow that then undermine, in this case, democracy. We know mm -hmm. what there is of it in our country. So I would, you know, I would really want people to be just absolutely devoted to studying this world, to studying the history, and to understand much better how they how it's. Well, in our case, how it's really just uh, stacked against us so much in it, you know? I know you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Um, something that's coming up for me, and we have so many questions about um, particular work that you've done, right? We have questions about looking for, for Zora. We have questions about the color purple. We have questions about In Search of Our Mother's Garden. And I'm, I'm thinking about how what you've just presented even, like this, this mandate for, for folks to study is moving in tandem with like your mandate for our folks to love. And I kind of just want to hear you talk more about how, um, how love and study and Blackness move together. Well, <clears throat> let us start with something very basic. The Black human vulva that has been under attack for 6,000 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, it's been really challenging <clears throat> to get people to really deal with that issue of FGM, <clears throat> of, you know, I don't know, this, this coffee is not, this tea is not working. <laughs> it's okay, take your time. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm offering this um, because I know it's one of the most challenging places that we as a people can go. And many of us are not going. But actually, if we never go there, if we never go there, and as, I, as far as I can see, we actually have no right to, to, to keep, you know, fussing about how terrible the world is treating us. Because look how terrible we're treating ourselves and our children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <clears throat> I know there's interest in the color purple and the film and the, you know, constant whatever and how it has a long life. And I'm grateful <clears throat> because I think it does a wonderful job of teaching about so many things. But there are so many things, you know, for us to really look at other than what is current or what is, I mean, it's 40 years old, so it's not really current, but, you know, there's so many things for us to really consider in a deeper way than by stoning the messenger. Mm. And I want us to get over that. You know, in all of these uh, uh, controversies, you know, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just basically saying, look at this. You know, I mean, and you don't have to get attached to trying to knock my hand down. Right. You, know? or you can just say, oh, yeah, well, we'll look at that. And then you go ahead and do something else. <clears throat> Hi, darling. I'm talking. I can't talk to you now. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. Ah. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So anyway, where were we? We were, you were talking about stoning the messenger and how we have a choice whether we get fixated on the hand that's delivering the message or we can we can make other decisions about how we respond. No, no, no. And we must, we must, I mean, don't even let people drag you into some fruitless controversy. Yes. About a crying child. There is no controversy. The child is crying. You know, the messenger by then, who knows, when I mean, she's gone on off to wherever and you're still there, you know, don't do that. It's just a waste of time. All right. And I think you just kind of answered again, the question about how you do your work and keep your peace, right? I think is because you, your work is the truth. So you keep your peace because you know that you're doing the work of the truth. <laughs> you keep it pushing. Well, it's the truth as I understand it. And, and um, <clears throat> <clears throat> I mean, there is no greater truth than a, a child is crying from being, being hurt. I mean, what greater truth is there? And who are we if we can't see that? I mean, who are we if we didn't say, well, you know, I don't care who's crying, you know, but you should have told me she's crying. And that's, mm -hmm. that's so where we have been, where we got stuck. And just don't have it. We don't have, you know, we have no time. We never had time for any of that. 
But now mm -hmm. we really have none, period. Following up on the, the sort of talking about the color purple, um, since it's been made into a film, recently into a musical, it's a kind of icon in the culture in many ways and shows up as a meme in, in, in various places. How do you think about that? Do you, how do you feel about the work having taken on its own life and been transformed into things far beyond or different from uh, what you may have intended or what you worked for, what you created yourself? Do you sort of ignore that or just forget about it? Or is, is the work when it's done, do you, is, it, is it done for you? Or do you follow the, the sort of different lives that the, that the book has had? It was a gift. It was a gift to me to be able to basically write in my grandparents' voices, a lot of it. I was very thankful. When I finished that novel, I cried I cried on my knees. Uh, and I really think that some of that gift that I felt and have felt is what people feel. They know it's a gift. You know, people, people have not been so stunned by the onslaught slot of Western civilization that they can't recognize a gift from ancestors. That's what they see. That's what they feel. You know, and they know some of the ancestors were just as rotten and just as raunchy and just as crazy as they still are. I mean, they want people around us now, just as, just as you know, whatever they are. Um, but I, you know, I offer what I can, you know, they always want, you know, more. So I offer what I have, you know, from wherever I am. That's my job. You know, that's what I'm supposed to do with what I have offered already. You know, I offer more of what I can, you know, what I can. Um, but do I hang on to it? No, not at all. And I feel when the people, you know, have taken the nourishment that they need, they won't either. And that that will be fine. And then I want to turn them loose on the temple of my familiar. Yes. <laughs> Which is much more to my, uh, my taste in a way, you know, I mean, I, I love it all because, you know, it's lovable. It's lovable because it, it's, it's, um, it has a certain humility in it, all of it, you know, it's like, okay, um, you know, got this and, um, no, don't know how it happened, but you know, I, I got to bring this. And so I'm very grateful. Yes. Well, I have to give a shout out to another alum of African-American studies at UC Berkeley, Jasmine Johnson, who gifted me a copy of the Temple of My Familiar when I graduated undergrad. Uh -huh. So just like the, the webs of legacy work and how, how big of a gift that was, even if I'm sure she knew because she must because because we'd be knowing. Um, but yes, absolutely. People love that novel. And and every time I go somewhere and there's always one person who's just been blown away and, and we, we collect, you know. Um, on the other hand, I'm you know, I'm happy wherever people are. I mean, I, I think all of my books have been for me miracles, you know, just the, the the um, it, because you know you actually it's like you draw um, so much just out of nothing. I mean, you know, that's how you you start to understand how full the universe is that you can create out of actually nothing. You know, and it's an incredible gift. Wow, and it keeps giving. It's just just. <laughs> Yeah, it's it like self-seeding flowers, like it just keeps happening. I don't cling to it either. When the day arrives when nothing is coming through me or to my, you know, I'm going to be so fine with it. Now, never. Um, do you read literary criticism of your work and think about it in relation? You know, send me something. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, like my friend, um, uh, Melanie, uh, has written this book about womanism in, 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 in terms of religion, you know. And I, you know, but I, you know what? I'm really happy when I feel somebody understands. Mm-hmm. That's what makes me happy. Somebody yeah. will, will write something or say something, and I will think, oh, what I was trying to give was received. Yeah. And that makes me very happy. But but I have to say, I don't really spend hardly any time where there's a controversy about it. You Absolutely. Know, I'd rather just go and do something else. For instance, there were years of controversy over the color purple. Yes. And during those years, I decided to start a publishing company. Uh, as I like to say, in order to publish other unpopular people. <laughs> <laughs> So um, who has time, you know, who has time? I mean, in other words, you will find if you haven't already that there is a mission in life. There is something for you to do. It's yours, it's yours. Nobody else can do it, really. And if you're doing that, you don't have time really to wonder or worry or care I mean, although caring is so natural and, and I've been deeply hurt, so, you know, there's that. But actually on another level, you realize that, oh, I have only so much time to fulfill whatever this is, is that I see as my work to do. Things that I understand that I somehow, and I'm sure you've had this experience. You know, you, you feel like, oh, I get this. I know what this is. Let me work on this. Mm-hmm. And the bliss that comes after that recognition mm-hmm. is so distracting. I mean, it, it's like, why would I want to get involved with <laughs> that when I'm perfectly happy being showered with the gold of this understanding, you know, this new, this new whatever it is. Because creation itself is just bliss. I mean, it is, it is just creating something out of nothing. I mean, what could be more wonderful? Yes. Wow. Um, can we talk for a second about another uh, unpopular person that you actually resurrected in a lot of ways? Can we talk about Zora Neale Hurston? Um, and and the like the the love work of finding her and the approach you took. Mm-hmm. What do you want to know? I just I think I'm trying to like again putting my questions mixing with the questions that we received. But why was it important for you to include your own journey um, in your telling of this of the reclamation of Zora Neale Hurston? I know my my father was deeply impacted by your story of going and putting a headstone on her grave, and like um, and so what what do you feel like um, was the importance of not just writing about like a, a essay about Zora Neale Hurston, but mm-hmm. writing a story of your work to find Zora? Okay, I just posted something on my blog, uh, just one line, and it says, um, in order to show people how beautiful they are, you have to show them how ugly they've been acting. (laughs) Got it? Okay. So in writing it in that way, I got to actually, you know, embody a, a behavior uh, that that is, I think, a, um, a more healthy one than 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 Zora had been subjected to, mm-hmm. and so so it was it was a showing, it was an enactment uh, of our duty, our responsibility, and our beauty, you know. Uh, and so, coming from the South, I knew that there would be people who would be so heartbroken and offended that that they let her slip by and down and out 
you know, and I wanted them to feel that. You know, I, it's so interesting because, you know, all these years later, you know, you go back there. Well, not now because everybody's pretty much dead. But at the time, it was remarkable how many people disclaimed any, um, you know, slights toward her, you know, any, you know, bad mouthing of her. You know, you know how people do. I mean, they, they clean up the act later on. Um, but But I think that in writing it in that way and pretending to be her niece, especially, it was a way of reminding people of our fam familial responsibility. I mean, this is a literary aunt and we have a responsibility to the people who show us anything of value. We do. And to think that we don't, that somehow, you know, you know, they can just kind of bleed out their hearts for us, you know, show us something to think that that can happen. And then we just take it and kick it, you know, to the curb if we want to, as, you know, Wright did and uh, what's his name, uh, Elsa. You know, they, they often, and then years later, you know, a new cr crop of really wonderful black male writers delighted in telling me that they'd never read her. I mean, they thought that, they thought that was a wonderful thing to tell me. And I could I look at them and think, you know, who are you? Who are you? Is, is, is being a man worth this? That mm -hmm. you're basically disowning a part of your soul. That this woman has been dragging up the hill to, to leave for you. Mm -hmm. Walker, you you um, write a lot about in your website. You talk about the sort of perspective of being an elder um, and commenting on you know, various things like Pose or the writing of Gore Vidal or whatever. Um, what does it mean to you to be an elder? Um, I just posted something else on my blog, which which just appeared out of nowhere, but it's a talk that I gave many 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 years ago. Uh, about how in our culture, people have often forgotten that they have a role to play as an elder. And instead of, you know, being that, which is to kind of be there for the youth, they're just trying to be the youth. Mm -hmm. And if you are all going to be the youth, we're lost. Mm -hmm. We have no guidance. Um, so, you know, I think that in every village, whether it's you know a village we create create like now, or however, uh, there there are people that we trust that we know we trust we know we trust them by the way they've lived their lives. That's the only way you can really, you know, know. You, you look at somebody and say, well, you know, where were they here and what what did they do there and so and then you know you say, oh. Yeah, I, I think I can listen to that person. And we have to have elders who are, you know, like Daphne Muse. You have to have people who recognize the value of being an elder, not a senior, you know, as in high school. I mean, you can be that too if you want to, but definitely uh, elder, elder, eldering uh, traditionally, and I think for as long as there have been humans, uh, has really meant something very positive, very nutritious spiritually uh, for the, for the you know the tribe. And people should stop being afraid of being old. You know it it is so it's so wasteful. Thank you. Um, wow, I'm like I know we're getting closer to time, but I I feel like like a duty to my <laughs> my generation of, of black feminist, womanist thinkers and feelers and writers and poets and actresses and dancers, um, just to ask, like, do you still feel like, like when you wrote the definition for womanist, 
Mm -hmm. um, you created so much space. Like I think almost every day about the last line, like she loves herself regardless. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that there's sometimes a lot of contention, like is a black feminist a womanist? Is a womanist a black feminist? Do you still, do you feel like there's a meaningful distinction or do you feel like there's some space there that's substantial? I feel like you should try to learn to know what you feel and go with that. I mean, I, I never, you know, offered that to cause any kind of dissension or fighting over who's got, you know, more of this or that. That's why it has that long definition. You know, it has a real meaning. It comes out of, of a specific history and culture. And it's just an offering. It's offering like anything else. You know, it's not, you know, meant to be fussed over and whatever else people do. It's just an offering. You know, it's like giving you a flower. Yeah. And then you, you look at the flower and you like it or you don't like it or you, you know, put it in your hair or you put it in a vase or you whatever. That's not my interest, you know. My interest is, and my responsibility was, to give you something to help you see yourself differently. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, choose it or not, it's all the same to me. <clears throat> yeah, and that you did. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and it's fun. I mean, that's the other part of it. <clears throat> I don't create, I mean, I was trying to explain to somebody how when I'm creating, even though I'm creating sometimes things that are just, oh, so rough, often I'm very, in some deep inner part of my spirit, so happy, so happy, because I get to shape it and give it a form that, it, that people can actually use. And if they use it, I can tell, you know, some part of me really understands that it's going to be like, you know, magic, I mean, in, in their lives, you know? I mean, think about Suge and Celie's kiss. It was a very close kiss, you know, nobody knew. Uh, but it really <laughs> was able to help so many people understand kissing. Yes. And that, you know, you have a right to kiss. I don't care who you're kissing. You know, kiss. I mean, that's the, so, so you know, so the, the joy of creativity, the joy of being able to offer, you know, a key to the locked door. Just get that key, unlock that door, be free. Yeah. This, this planet has so much to do with being free. You can't really, enjoy this planet the way it's meant to be enjoyed if you're if you're a slave of anything is there any advice that you would give to your younger writing self or to younger writers <laughs> any advice um other than be free mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well Study, be free, enjoy your life. You know, dance when you feel like dancing. You know, sleep outside under the moon when you want to. Uh, swim in whatever body of water appeals to you. Although the ocean is a little tricky now because of Fukushima on our coast and on the other coast, you know, Chernobyl, but <laughs> sigh. But, but live, you know, live your life, live it. I mean, I don't care if, you know, every time you open your mouth, somebody's, you know, ready to throw something at you, you know, or trip you up or, or lie about you or whatever. You know, the, the, the joy of being here, I think only comes if you are really here as you. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be here. I mean, think of all the people who, who were here as somebody else. I mean, and now who comes to mind but Sammy Davis Jr. But, you know, he, <laughs> he's one person, you know. I mean, he, he, but you know what I mean. Yeah. That, that, that you have to really love, you know, nature. If you, if you love nature as I love nature, um, 
you will always feel that you belong. Everything in nature is just what it is. And so are we. You know, if we can trust that. And I'm right because if I weren't right, I wouldn't be here. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I feel like we need to be holding hands at this point. Like I'm, I'm just looking at the faces in, the, in our little Zoom space and there's so much life and movement and feeling and emotion. We plan to do that after the pandemic. If there's an end to the pandemic, let's gather somewhere. Yeah. You no, know, the, the other part of, of my uh, you know, talk all these years has been the necessity of circles. You have to have some kind of circle uh, to, to play off of each other and to share and to talk and to be down, grounded with the reality of where we are. We are in a terrible situation, you know? And we, need, we, we mustn't be alone. So we are very smart. We'll figure out how to deal with this. But it's really important that we circle whenever we can, and it's great if we can do it in person. But if we can't, you know, this is great. I love this. <laughs> wow. I'm like, Derek, what do we, what say you? <laughs> That's a wonderful point at which to come to a close, but um, are there any other questions we want to ask? No, I think I just want to say thank you. Um, and just again, my heart's still full, you know, I'm still feeling just flushed with so much excitement and gratitude. Um, and yeah, just thank you for, for giving so abundantly in your work and in conversation with us today. Yeah, I want to echo that and, and say also that, um, you know, when I was asking that question about theorizing, part of what Barbara Christian was saying in that essay was that what we think of as theorizing is not necessarily the, the kind of theory that gets, has really been done in, in the African-American intellectual tradition, uh, and that we should be looking at other sources and fiction being one of those. And I, you know, as a teacher who's taught your work and um, has been in the academy for a long time, I, I feel that you have contributed a great deal to our thinking as, as students of African-American culture and literature. And uh, your gift has been immense and I, I'm just really grateful for it. I know we all are and thank you so much for it. Well, I thank all of you for being beautiful. I think beauty is just such an incredible gift to each other, to the world, to the universe. It mirrors the universe. Mm -hmm. you and you're all beautiful. You're all doing your work, which is another form of beauty. Mm. And I'm very grateful that you were here and that you're, you know, carrying on. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Can we clap? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> please, please show some appreciation for Miss Alice Walker. Ms. Malik Mhotep, Professor Derek Scott, we thank the three of you. I'm sure most of you would agree that we just experienced creative genius. And we are indeed living in the stream of our ancestors. So amazing, thank you so, so very much. Tomorrow, all of you will receive an email from us where you can comment and reflect on what you just witnessed. Additionally, you will receive an email alerting you to our next conversation on February 22nd, Black Feminism and the Sonic Archive with Professors Daphne Brooks and Carter Mathis. And it's gonna be moderated by our own Professor Lee Rayford. We look forward to seeing all of you on February 22nd and we deeply, deeply appreciate your participation today. Thank you.